welcome and as always please ask questions as we go along um, as I like to say any questions you have might be you know the answer to that question might be the most valuable information for you um, I will try to accommodate the uh, wish that we um, you know that that I show you some of the plants that are in the giveaway this Saturday um, I'll have have to be pulling those from memory, but um, you know I had a big hand in deciding which ones go in the giveaway. So um, we'll see a bunch, certainly not all of them. Um, last month's talk was monocot madness, which if you were here um, a month ago, you know that I ended up having to give that tour. I found out you know a few hours earlier than. Uh, that morning that uh, I needed to uh, give that tour. And uh, Mark and I split the tours up over the course of the year, and I hate choosing topics. Um, but since he had already chosen Monocot Madness, I thought, well, I'll do, you know, Dicot. I don't even remember. Dicots of notes. Dicots of notes. <laughs> so we do have to talk about Dicots and Monocots, which is a, probably more botanical than. Um, Horticulture, but botany is one of the sciences that. Um, no, what what was the word that just slipped out of my? It, not, I was going to say influences, but that's it's one of the sciences that informs um, horticulture. Um, the terms dicots and monocot only apply apply to flowering plants. It doesn't apply to you know the more primitive plants that aren't flowering plants, things like the uh, gymnosperms, which are all the conifers, or even more primitive ferns like fer uh, ferns and mosses. Um, so those two terms, dicot and monocot, apply to the flowering plants, and all flowering plants are divided into one group or the other. Um, the cotyledon or a cot part of dicot and um, monocot referred to the cotyledons, the seed leaves. Everybody's sown a bean plant, you know when it comes up, you have those two leaves that die meaning two, that plant is a dicot. You sow something like corn, you get one leaf, and so that's a monocot. Um, now, there are a few plants, and we'll talk about cyclamen in a minute, in a minute that are um, dicots, so they do have two seed leaves, but you only ever see one come above because the second seed leaf becomes the tuber, the you know, quote, quote unquote bulb of the cyclamen. So uh, sometimes the things that are dicot don't show um, two leaves because one of those di one of those seed leaves is becoming something else. Um, so that, that's, that's the main difference between the um, dicots and monocots, but there is another, I think maybe even more interesting difference, and I ne never really realized this until Chris Glenn pointed it out a month ago, and that is um, monocots, the things with just one seed leaf, do not have a cambium. Dicots do have a cambium, at least the woody dicots have a cambium. And, you know, I don't, probably all of you know that can, the cambium is that thin layer on a woody plant that occurs between the, um, the inner wood and the bark. It's just a, you know, a cell or several, several cells thick, but that's where all the growth happens. It lays down new cells, so the inner wood becomes wider and it re, uh, puts down a new bark layer because as, as a trunk gets thicker, the old bark cracks and splits off and it has to lay um, a new layer of bark, you know, sort of like a snake shedding its skin. It, um, it has to create new bark in order to allow the inner bark, the inner wood to expand. Um, and because monocots do not have a cambium, um, their trunks don't get thicker. If you think of something like a sable palm, it's the same thickness for its whole life. The trunk doesn't get thicker. And if you visit some place like Charleston or Savannah where um, cabbage palms are a real common street tree, you can tell at the height of the plant um, when it got transplanted. 
because the trunk will be an even thickness until the point where it gets narrow, and that was during the uh, transition period when it was you know, had gotten dug up, probably had all its fronds cut off, probably had all its roots off, probably sat in the nursery for months before someone replanted it. And so since the growth is, is greatly reduced at that point, the trunk is narrower than when the tree was growing well. So for the rest of the life of that palm, it'll come up you know, to a certain height, go in, and then once it gets reestablished, we'll assume the normal width for a cabbage palm. Doug? Yeah. Since the cambium is where the growth is, and you have the tall end of nutrients going down and the side end of the roots bringing stuff up, is that only happening in that cambium layer or where else? It's, it's not growth? happening just in the cambium layer, but it, you know, on, a, on a tree, the in, inner part of the trunk is no longer, um, you know, it's no longer really alive. But the new, newer layer of the inner, inner bar, uh, not inner bark, the inner trunk is, is where a lot of that water flow is in the younger part. I think I'm correct in saying that. The cambium is just where the new layers are made. The new yeah. layers are where the tr um, transportation goes on. And wood is dead and phloem is alive. Um, another difference between dicots and monocots is the monocots usually had parallel veination. You can see that the, you can see the major veins and they're all uh, close to being parallel. And dicots usually have um, a netted vein. Um, and that's, I think those two are very clear in those. We can pass those around. And um, monocots tend to have flower parts like sepals and petals and threes or sixes and dicots have um, um, petals usually in fours or fives or, and you know in more primitive members of that family like water lilies and um, oh, some of the magnolias they have many more petals than, um, than four to five. Um, I think that's all I'm going to say about monocots and dicots. Um, I did mention um, cyclamen as an example of a dicot where one of the seed leaves becomes the tuber. But I also wanted to show off um, my new little acquisition. Um, cyclamen heterofolium, and we'll see some out here in a moment, are usually, the typical color is a very pale pink, and I like saturated colors, and um, this is from a nursery in Pennsylvania that was um, in Virginia this weekend for the Pinot Nursery Open House, and he had two new color forms of cyclamen heterofolium, this being one of them, and the other one was a more amazing color, but not, I didn't like the color as much, plus it was $75, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was a true coral pink, sort of close to this lady's uh, t-shirt there, but uh, red darker than that, with no blue in it at all, and that was really a, an amazing color break. And both of those uh, color colors were found in the wild. They weren't the result of some, you know, hi some hybridizers work. Okay. Well, we will start the tour, and two several of the plants in the giveaway are species, not species, cultivars of. Um, star jasmine. I don't think this is one of them. It's uh, Trichella spermum asiatica nagapa on the list. I don't think so. But um, we'll go back of the building. There's one back there that's definitely in the giveaway. This is a selection um, of star jasmine or asiatic jas jasmine. Hatsuyuki. When the growth is real new, there's a lot of pink to it, but it retains this white variegation throughout the year. They're evergreen vines. Um, they're strong climbers, given something to climb, but they also make a really good ground cover. Um, some people will mow them once a year to keep them shorter as a ground cover. Were you indicating that you do? I mow it every year. Okay, well, <laughs> thank you. You can see there, it's starting to climb the wall. So it's both a twiner, it'll twine up, you know, something slender enough to twine around, but
but it'll also attach to um, a rough surface. I have a feeling they're not, not going to stay attached to this concrete too, too well because this concrete is very, very hard and, and slick. Um, this is in a fair amount of shade because it's only a brief time where it has direct sun, but you can grow this out in full sun and it's a quite, rather, it's a um, very commonly grown as a ground cover in much warmer parts of the country like in Florida and stuff you'll often see it as a ground cover. Um, there is another cultivar in the giveaway, um, Angustifolia, meaning narrow leaf, and it's a very narrow leaf, but we'll, we'll see that one in a few minutes. Um, any questions? For this one, Doug, I've noticed that um, the coloring is better in the sunnier spots than yeah, in shaded spots. It's underneath the dogwood at my house, and wherever it's gone past the dogwood, it's really colorful and quite outstanding, and underneath it, it's mostly boring green. <laughs> and um, this one, um, we have quite a few different cultivars in the garden, and um, this one is actually widely available in the nursery trade. It's usually not um, marketed under its correct cultivar name, which is its original Japanese um, cultivar name, but um, I think the name it's sold under is Snow in the Summer or something like that. I think it has multiple names. I yeah. think that's one, and we had it listed as tricolor for a good number of oh, years. Oh, okay. Yeah, but if you see something that you know looks very much like this, though the the coming from a nursery where I'm sure it would have been grown in full sun, you'll see, you know, this much white, but also a lot of pink. It's a pretty thing. Um, and Doug referred to mowing. I do mow mine uh, every spring, kind of mid March or so. Put the lawnmower in the highest setting. Just go over it, it cleans up all the oak leaves out of it, gives it a nice uniform uh, top appearance, and I'm done in less than five minutes in my beds and can't beat that. I think that's valuable because things like this or English ivy, of course I'm not promoting growing English ivy, no, they just get deeper and deeper and deeper. I mowed my ivy too. <laughs> Good. Okay, we'll just back up a little bit and go up towards the road. This is the time of time of year when the hardy cyclamen start to bloom. Um, this is, um, this is to my mind sort of the time, this is sort of the beginning of a new garden year in the fall. Um, there are a lot of things that um, start to bloom um, this time of year, especially a lot of flowering bulbs. It's also the time that uh, some of the things that are dormant in the summer um, come back into growth um, and grow through the winter. We'll certainly see lots of arum metallic in, um, coming back up and its foliage will be very evident in the winter garden but then disappears by early summer or so. Um, <coughs> this particular cyclamen, I, yeah there's a label for it, is cyclamen heterofolium. Heterofolium meaning leaf-like hetera which is English ivy. Um, they start to bloom. Well, they can. St I've seen flowers on them as early as June. I'm not June, but July and August, and they sort of spit and sputter for a while. But in October, they tend to uh, bloom the most heavily. And um, about in October, they start to put up foliage. And these are um, a strain with solid silver or heavily silver marked leaves. The wild type is a green leaf with. Um, silver veining through the leaf and the foliage is really beautiful through the winter months. Um, cyclamen heterofolium is the easiest of the um, hardy cyclamen. Um, there's a couple other species that are blooming now. I don't know if, we, well we have Graycum um, which doesn't spread as widely as heterofolium and then Mirabile and um, Silicicum and Intaminatum are three other species that are fall blooming, but then there's others that bloom in the winter and some that wait, a few that wait till spring. Um, they all prefer a spot that's um, on the drier side in the, in, the, in the summer. So, you know, the shady areas often are, are really good for them because they tend to be dry if the shade is produced by um, trees. 
any things I should, any plants in this area that people have questions about? Does, do you know if voles bother the cyclamen? The question was, do voles bother the cyclamen? Um, I'm not sure of the answer. Um, I tend to think not. Um, squirrels will sometimes dig them up, nibble them a little bit, and then discard them so they might end up um, someplace other than where you planted them. Um, you know, little summer dormant bulbs, like um, I'll use bulbs for them um, that are dormant in the summer. They're often good for those dry, rooty places like under our native red maple where it's so hard to grow anything, but they'll tolerate that summer dry. And then in that dense rooted area, it's a bit harder for squirrels to dig them up. Yes. It is the new new leaves that this is autumn fern, Japanese autumn fern. This this very handsome evergreen fern, and yeah. the new fronds um, tend to be red. Yeah. But then there's stuff like that, but that happens. Yeah, I'm not. Is that leaf going by? That almost looks like. It. Well, I don't know. See, it doesn't look like it is. That's no. What I was wondering. But I it's, it's, it's hard to explain. Yeah. Uh, wow. And they tend the autumn fern um, is evergreen. Um, and it, but it, it tends to, you know, it puts up most of its new growth in the spring. Um, but then it lasts. But exactly. then it also tends to put up a bunch more fronds about this time of year. I don't really know why, but maybe just it knows the leaves are going to be off the trees soon, provided <laughs> it's a deciduous tree. Um, and so uh, can make use of the winter sun when the leaves are off the tree. The autumn fern is a fern I recommend very highly. It's it's real tough. Um, it tends to get better once once you get it established and it's easy to establish. And it is evergreen, but any of your evergreen ferns, you, you t generally want to cut to the ground um, by late winter before they start putting up new growth because the old foliage is tired at that time. The plant doesn't need you to do that because it's going to grow just as well with its ratty old fronds, but I think you'll enjoy the appearance <laughs> of it better. This is another great fern, and I know the ferns aren't monocots or die cut, but... Oh, I know, it's sometimes called upside-down fern. I don't really know why, but it's absolutely gorgeous. And it's Arachnoides standishii. A Standishii, just you know, named for somebody with the family name of Standish, uh, Arachnoides. Well, o the oides end would indicate that it looks, it resembles Arach, which I guess Arachnides or something is another species of fern. I find it a little bit slow to establish, and then it'll take up, take a number of years to build up. But then you end up with this gorgeous fern. The frond texture is just so beautiful. Yes. Oh, that, that's a good plant to point out. Thank you, Marilyn. Yeah, this is a little um, syningia. So you can see um, the florist gloxinia or syningias. So, oh, I'm sorry. So it's uh, um, related to them. And we don't know if it's going to be winter hardy, but we, we have so many plants of it. And actually, thank you, that's also in the giveaway. Mm -hmm. So whether you... Um, want to you know plant it in your garden and see if it's winter hardy or you could certainly easily grow it as a house plant the gloxinias are in the same family as um, african violets needs much that same care and it seems to bloom continuously obviously it's not going to bloom through the winter months but in the greenhouse here it does so it blooms almost well it blooms pretty much year round and those were little plants planted you know maybe in April or so and they really have settled in nicely and it's a pretty leaf too did you get a good picture of that for the for the website I don't know no I mean it's, I it's, mean now with this oh with well this silly the, this thing. is this is video yeah. I'll go back later <laughs> yeah. and do it for there but oh I see that's I not see. for the giveaway so it's whatever we have photographs of in the in the collection 
No, I wasn't thinking for the giveaway. I was just thinking we just spent a half hour talking about them and you might, <laughs> the people that are watching this might want to see that. I go back when we're done and I record all of them individually. I've, I've never watched one of those. <laughs> <laughs> He's already heard. He, he doesn't like the guest speaker very much. <laughs> no respect for the speaker. All right, well, any, any more questions out in this area? Um, I realized today we're getting dry and so it's hard for me to imagine getting dry after 7.2 inches of rain not too long ago. The Arboretum is not blessed with that lovely red clay that so much of the Piedmont has in North Carolina. Um, and so this root beer plant is wilting. Um, it's not being terribly fragrant today and thank goodness Mar uh, Chris put in scratch and sniff film in the camera, but um, <laughs> it does have a delightful uh, root beer fragrance. Um, much like, um, so, well, Elysium sort of has a mm -hmm. similar fragrance. Um, it's in, um, the genus is Piper, which is the same genus as black pepper. You know, the black pepper you smother your black, uh, baked potatoes with and such. Um, and that is a typical, I'm going to call it a flower, but it's an inflorescence of that family. Um, and if you grow houseplants, you might also think, gee, that looks a lot like the flowers on your peperomia. Well, same family, same type of inflorescence. Um, here it dies to the ground in the winter, I, I'm sure in a frost-free climate. Um, it keeps the stems from year to year. but fully winter hardy here. We, it wasn't set back by this cold winter at all. Just a fun, big, bold foliage plant. Okay. Where did you see the, um, genus? the genus is Piper, P-I-P-E-R, and it's Piper auritum, A-U-R-I-T-U-M, and auritum is probably, in a lot of plants you see auricula, which refers to ears and it usually refers to, you know, the, the shape of the sinus here on the leaf. It's sort of ear-like. Um, so I think that's probably what auretum is referring to in this plant. And, um, you know, being a dicot, you see it has um, a net-like series of veins through the leaf. Um, it can be rooted from cuttings, certainly if you you know, it could also be propagated by division. It's not one in the giveaway today, or this week, this year. Asking that question. Um, Viv just asked if I think this was damaged by the heavy rain. Possibly. Um, it might have encouraged it to defoliate earlier, but if you turn around and look at the Zelkova, I'm worried we're losing that. And Tim, lives in Raleigh. I live in Durham, but, and I don't, I don't get out, you know, I sort of drive home and I'm home. So I, I don't, can't speak for Zelkovas in Durham, but um, Tim said around Raleigh, he's seeing a lot of Zelkovas that look like that. Hmm. Now the other Zelkovas at the Arboretum that I've seen um, are all green. And that's sort of an odd sight for the, um, it to suffer from excess water because it's on that steep slope. Yeah. Um, several of the plants that died um, from that seven inches of rain, um, are, we have a second plant of the exact same cultivar and in, in the in, I can think of two instances where we lost one of each pair and the one we lost was on level ground and the ones that are still fine are on a steep slope. So I'm sort of surprised that that um, Zelkova is suffering and it has otherwise um, seemed healthy. I don't see anything else wrong with it. The, if you read the e-newsletter, the tree that I mentioned died from the rain, the BB tree. Um, after we cut it down, we realized there was this, the heavy rain was probably the final straw, straw that there was some, something going on with the trunk to begin with, you know, some pathogen or something. I think this was losing leaves before the hurricane, wasn't it? I, I can't speak for that. I don't get around the arboretum as much as I should. 
And probably before Saturday, I need to do a little trimming so people can buy it with their wagons. There's a couple of off-season flowers in a bud. Too. Yeah, off-season flowering can often be um, a sign of stress. Um, it does it every year? Yeah. Oh, well, we might as well talk about this is Japanese <laughs> snowbell, um, Styrex japonica. Um, not the typical form, as you would guess, but a weeping form. And it's actually uh, supposed to be a pink form. Is it pinker in the spring? A cool weather. So it's, yeah. it's sometimes pink and sometimes yeah. not. Yeah, uh, the red pigments, a, a lot of the red pigments, the anthocyanins, require uh, available sugar. Um, in warm weather, the plants tend to burn up the sugar they produce as quickly as they produce it. But when there's excess sugar, when photosynthesis is happening at a faster rate than respiration, and there's extra sugar, then the red pigment can form because the sugar molecules are part of that red pigment. That's why some re green leaf things are red in the fall before they shed their leaves because th there's available sugar. But, um, you know, a lot of these weeping trees, I think, are most interesting when they're leafless because you get to see the striking architecture of the plant. Um, a, you know, notable plant today, the varies calicarpus. This is actually um, our native one, Calicarpa americana. The typical color is a darker purple. This is Wel Welch's pink. Um, and once a year I teach a, um, a pruning class for um, mostly flowering deciduous shrubs. And um, Calicarpa blooms on new wood, the current year's growth. So I think, yeah, it was this, this um, um, March, it, March is when we usually mm -hmm. do the class. Mid-March. Um, we cut this plant to the ground. And so you can cut it to the ground in late winter, early spring, and it's still going to grow back and uh, flower and fruit because it blooms on new wood. Now, last week I had a volunteer ask me, how come his oak leaf hydrangeas never bloom? And usually when somebody asks that question, it's be the answer is you're pruning them at the wrong time. And he also, you know, an oak leaf hydrangea, you know, if you chose the right cultivar you know if you need a small plant you grow plant a small growing variety you don't really need to shorten the canes but most people especially guys I think it's more of a guy thing it's like they wake up in the morning and think I need to go out and chop on something <laughs> and um, you know I explained to uh, and I took him around and the other volunteers that I was working with that morning and showed him and I can show this to you today too how a lot of things you can already see this winter or next spring's flower buds. So if you're cutting the stems back now, you're cutting off the flower buds. Um, but Calicarp is a die cut. Again, you can see the, um, you know, the net venation in the leaf. Um, and and it, something that's a real common occurrence is China has a much richer um, uh, diversity of plants. We have one North American Calicarpa, Calicarpa americana. There's the Mexican species Acuminata, which you can see just down here past the uh, McSwain building. Um, but China, I don't know, they have like 20, 30, maybe 60 different species, and you'll see a lot of those species in the Arboretum. Here's a really clear example of how you can see next year's flower buds already. These big terminal buds on um, this azalea are next year's flower buds. Now um, some plants um, have flower buds and vegetative buds. Other plants have mixed buds where they don't have two different types of buds. Each bud will have shoots and flowers. But on an azalea, these great big buds are the flower buds and then there's smaller buds around the base of it that will be the vegetative buds. So this will produce, the big bud will produce the cluster of flowers, but um, then the little vegetative buds below it will become next year's new growth. So, you know, these buds, if you come in and chop this plant now, you're not going to have flowers next spring. 
there are plenty of plants that I'm sure have their flower buds already, but they're harder to see. I don't, I don't know that we can. Um, I, I, I don't think we can find the flower buds on this uh, quince, but there are plenty of examples where they're real evident already. We saw the the um, <laughs> pink and white variegated uh, Asian jasmine over there. This we have two things mingling here right now. This broadleaf plant is a vinca, and then this narrow leaf one is um, a narrow leaf form of the same species of, um, of Asian jasmine, a trichellospermum. And um, it just has a, you know, an interesting texture with that very fine leaf. And like any of the other ones, it'll climb if it has something to climb up. You can, yeah, it's climbing up the uh, cherry. Excuse me. Um, one thing, I, um, when it's grown as a ground cover, it won't flower. It'll only flower if it climbs up something. Um, also in the plant giveaway are two or three different Eleagnus, and I'm staring off that direction because they're in this bed but at the back. And um, we can pass through there quickly if anybody wants to see them. They're very similar cultivars. They're distinct cultivars, but they're um, both have a lot of yellow in the leaf. Um, the Eleagnus are, if, if they don't have something to climb, they just make a big mound. But if they have something to climb, they will climb, you know, I've seen them 60 feet up a big willow oak. Um, and they climb, they have these little, little, let me get rid of that. They have these little uh, downward, sort of like side twigs that I think think of as sort of grappling hooks. They make these great big whippy stems and, you know, they end up over the branch on a tree they're near and, and then they're, you know, hooked onto it just like a grappling hook. And I think that's actually the main purpose of thorns on roses, on a climbing rose. Those little thorns act like a grappling hook because a rose doesn't, uh, you know, twine and Eleagnus doesn't twine. And neither one has, you know, tendrils or neither one can grow roots and adhere to a surface. So both of them use, um, you know, either little side twigs or a thorn as grappling hooks. But um, the main reason why I propagated them is because they've gotten too big for this area. So we're going to plant new ones somewhere else in the Arboretum where there's more room and get them out of this area. But um, what we can... If somebody wants to see them, we'll quickly just pass through there. Can, and can you do your rejuvenation pruning with those? Can you cut those way back? They wouldn't regrow? Oh, you can cut them to the ground and they'll regrow. Okay. Um, that's not the... That's often a, a valid way to deal with an overgrown shrub. That's that's not really the type of pruning I'm teaching in my pruning class. You've taken the pruning <laughs> class, yeah, right? I understand. Yeah. 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 No, but sometimes when something is completely overgrown, um, sure, cut it to the ground, and if it's a broadleaf plant and not a conifer, you're almost guaranteed that it will grow. Now, talking about old wood and new wood, when it comes to hydrangeas, um, some bloom on new wood and some bloom on old wood. Basically, um, if something blooms in the spring, it probably already has its flower buds by now, and if something's summer blooming, it probably um, blooms on new new wood, meaning, meaning the current year's growth. So this is hydrangea paniculata, which is summer blooming. If you cut this to the ground now or by early spring, it will still bloom that same year because it blooms on new wood. But you're, um, we have a macrophylla over here. I might be able to find flower buds on it. Um, macrophylla flower buds um, in most cultivars are produced in the terminal bud. So even if you just nip the stems back a little bit, you're cutting off the flower buds and you won't have bloom next year. Especially if it's, uh, you know, an older variety that blooms just once in the summer. The newer selections that bloom repeatedly, you could butcher them in the winter and you won't have the big bloom in May or June, but you'll still get some repeat bloom later on in the summer. But, um, 
right. Did anybody want to see the LEI deer? Well, Doug, quick question. When do you think the last point in time is you can prune in the summer and not interfere with the bud formation for the next year? I tend to think, you know... Or is it best right after they flowered? I, that's a good good guideline, yeah. It, but the, the thing is, um, you know, hydrangea macrophylla only get, you know, so tall. If they're getting too tall and you have to cut them back every year, my inclination would be to replace them with a smaller growing variety. Well, you know, hydrangea, when we get out here, I will show you same species, different selection. There's one out here called Daruma, and it's never been pruned, and it's this tall. So, you know, nowadays, if you want a particular plant, crepe myrtle, hydrangeas, uh, whatever, in a particular size, well then do your uh, research before you buy something. Um, you know, the type of pruning these need is really just cutting out old stems. This clearly has gotten a good amount of, well, you know what's probably going on here? This might have, um, had, this might have got cut to the ground by the cold winter. Mm -hmm. So, um, somebody probably cut it, all the previous year's stems to the ground because they were dead. Mm -hmm. Um, hydrangea macrophylla, um, different cultivars vary in their winter hardiness so especially if you're buying a florist one some of those are, are not reliably winter hardy even though they're all the same species all right well yeah one of the plants on the list is the abutilon little imp mm -hmm. this is the same species abutilon megapotamicum but this is one called ruffles mm -hmm. and the main difference is these petals are sort of a buff yellow and little limp is a bright yellow and if you want to see our ancient original plant of um, little imp if you go up to the necessary but instead of going in the door you look to, to the right cor far corner of the little terrace outside the restrooms it's right there and has been there for all of this century at least and um, <laughs> it starts blooming early and it'll continue blooming well past frost. We've probably seen it bloom in December still. Um, better in shade than in, out in full sun. Um, and, uh, you know, hummingbirds love it too. I, I love the, the, the plant, it's a sweet thing. Um, Can I ask my question about the deer? <laughs> um, I don't specifically have experience with the butylon. Uh, uh, deer do eat. Um, a butylon is in the same family as hibiscus and you see if you spread those petals and you look at the reproductive parts inside it looks very much like a hibiscus um, and deer do eat hibiscus and um, okra which is the same family as well so I would tend to think they might but that's exactly the kind of assumption that you know could be wrong um, you know deer you know, a real surprising one is deer absolutely love our East, Eastern North American um, arbovida, Thuia um, occidentalis, but the hybrid one, green giant, they don't eat. Of course, who's going to say they eat them in your garden? Yeah. Somebody's going to say that. Oh, do they? Okay. <laughs> There's always something. And um, I only have one hibiscus in my yard and the deer don't touch it. It's the Confederate Rose. Okay. Is that I'm putting it to uh, Mutabilis or? Yeah, Mutabilis. Yeah. And which don't I touch don't think is blooming yet. Well, and actually Mutabilis is in the giveaway a few plants, just a few plants. It's probably not on your list. Yeah, you know, um, we don't, the thing we just have a few of, we don't put on the list so people don't get their hearts broken too often. <laughs> um, there is a salvia down here that's in the giveaway. If it's, do I, anybody want to see it? It's a good selection of salvia gregii type. Um, Diane, it's a lovely sort of red violet. It's been here forever. It's, it's good all summer long. These little um, salvias are often called autumn sages. And I suspect in the southwest U.S. And, and Mexico where they're native, where summer's really dry, they might sort of be half dormant through the summer and they only freshen up in the fall, but with our 
greater amount of rain, they tend to bloom from spring up and well, they'll continue past the early light frost. Hummingbirds love them. You can see the, the bees are enjoying them. Um, I think we have a few plants of Dicliptera in the giveaway. Um, this plant with the fuzzy, somewhat grayish leaf and the orange flowers is um, Dicliptera, Dicliptera subarecta. I don't know a common name for it. Um, it's in the Acanthus family, um, mm. native to the southwest. Uh, winter hardy here. We, you know, it doesn't start blooming till maybe mid to late summer, but the foliage is pretty nice. And this is the best display I've ever seen. I think in the ground, especially on rich soil, it tends to grow more lushly here. It's growing less lushly and, and putting more energy into flowering. But as you might guess, with a tubular flower like this, the hummingbirds do enjoy it. Um, we've been doing a fair amount of planting up here, but a lot of the things we planted are small still. So maybe a year from now will look, look better. Um, we have a Vitex, actually, a Vitex in the giveaway, um, not this pink one, um, and not exactly this species, but it has a similar um, palmately compound leaf, but with a cut edge. Um, but the flowers are the blue-violet flowers, that is the more typical color of Vitex. And as you can see, the big carpenter bees love it, and other bees love it as well and very drought tolerant. Some. The cactus? Yeah, um, we accepted a donation of, of somebody's mother's collection of cactus. <laughs> um, and it was, I don't know, 50, 60 plants, potted plants, and most of them went home one or two at a time with, you know, volunteers or employees and stuff. So most of them went to good homes, but there were numerous pots of this one. So we just stuck them up here. It's not a species that's winter hardy, but we've enjoyed it this um, summer. And I think these are open at night. That's why they're not open now. Um, I think it's the genus Sirius, C-E-R-E-U-S. I'm never quite sure how to pronounce that. Will these be open more than one night? I don't know. Usually I think they don't. Yeah, I don't know. There's a bunch of cactus that are night blooming. A moment ago when we were out here by all the weeping plants and I was talking about the great big hydrangea limelight. Um, and that's, you know, limelight, the full size hydrangea paniculatas will get about the size of a dogwood tree. I'm going to have to take a tall person with me sometime and photograph some big ones I know of in Durham just so I can prove to you they get that big. But. You know, I mentioned if, if you need a smaller growing one, then just select the right cultivar. This one has not been pruned to keep it this size. I don't know that this one has ever been pruned. And uh, I have a, a suspicion that Daruma might be Japanese for dwarf because like there was the Laura Petal and Daruma that was supposed to just get three feet tall. Of course, it gets more like five, six feet tall, but still they use the word Daruma. Now, sometimes when I start to see a name used over and over again, I start to think, well, that must mean something. Like, you know, for years we grew um, sweet flag, uh, gold form, um, a chorus graminius, ogon, and then you realize everything that is called ogon is gold. So then you realize, oh, that must be Japanese for gold. You know, there's the gold. Dawn Redwood, which is Ogon. Um, there's the yellow form of Spirea thunbergia, which is Og Ogon. So I suspect Daruma might mean dwarf. Is it dead? No, it, this one has always tended to uh, defoliate early. I this think that's an extra dwarf one that Tim found, seedling. Oh, and actually, I see. And the on X the label, means it's a seedling of it. That it says. EX period Daruma yeah. and I can't tell you what the full word is for for which uh, EX is an abbreviation but that indicates 
that it's not the cultivar Daruma, but it is, you know, derived from derived from Daruma. Mm -hmm. Thanks for pointing that out. Mm -hmm. I'm not the most observant person. <laughs> this time of year, the th some of the things that are dormant through the summer months are coming back up. This is the Italian Arum just starting to come back up, but those leaves will get about like that big and, uh, you know, looking possibly tropical all winter long. Um, this is um, Abelmoscus. No, it's not Abelmoscus. It's Malva viscus, um, which is another hibiscus relative. Now it has the common name I've known it by forever is probably considered politically incorrect nowadays called uh, and the common name is Scotchman's Purse because it doesn't open um, <laughs> but if you has the five petals that are typical of both dicots and specifically the hibiscus family but if you spread them out and you see the reproductive parts in the middle it does look a lot like a typical hibiscus flower this is like a brown cover almost. Well, it's a more shrub-like, and I suspect in a milder climate it is a shrub. For us it dies to the ground with a cold winter, but always comes back. But it's sort of flopped and become more of a ground cover. Uh, further down in the perennial border, you'll see one exhibiting more typical growth habit. The normal color is this scarlet red. This is a white uh, selection, but the white selection will throw branches that are scarlet so um, hmm. I think there's some of this white one in the um, giveaway it's on the list yeah, yeah okay good good um, I love the plant I don't like the white all that much um, but it's a great plant tough as all get out blooms through the hottest driest part of summer despite the flowering flower being closed like that great big bumblebees will force their way into it and hummingbirds love it yeah um, you know it'll take the hottest sunniest dry spot but it doesn't have to have sun all day I've seen them bloom fairly well with a fair amount of shade there's a pink one too isn't there yeah pink? Um, well there's two pink else? ones okay we have both of them and if um, if you held the flowers up one against the other you would see they are distinct there's pam's pink down in the zarek garden and further down in the perennial border we have another pink selection that doesn't have a name i i, I got it from um big bloomers and um we've had some of that on the uh, plant cart a lovely Coryopsis native to the southeast, um, Coryopsis helianthoides, fall blooming, just, you know, started blooming about a week ago, but it'll go on for a good spell. It's just a pretty, pretty little thing, and um, this spot is not wet, but it will, I think in the wild you tend to see it in, in a wet spot. And, you know, the common, some of the more common Coryopsis are short-lived perennials, but this is the type of perennial that, you know, you tend to have long-term. I didn't re realize to just now that this pomegranate is loaded with fruit. Um, not very colorful fruit. Mm -mm. Um, which is, is this State Fair? Yeah, this is State Fair. This is one that Tony Avent named i guess it was one growing at the state fair if you know tony's earlier life before he started a nursery he was in charge of the grounds as um at the state fair um you know showy flowers fruit i don't think the fruit has no fragrance They're not all that far away, if anybody, anybody want any. Um, <laughs> I love pomegranates, but I like mine red. <laughs> yeah, and um, I love to eat, but I'm, I'm, I'm too lazy to eat pomegranates most of the time. <laughs> they're, they're easy, easy to grow. They're very low maintenance plants. Now, um, in, in a garden center, if you find a pomegranate, very often it's an ornamental one, and the ornamental ones usually have 
really fully, fully double flowers, and most of the double flowered ones don't set fruit. So if you want fruit, then make sure you find one that is actually a fruiting variety. Um, this is Clarodendron, Clarodendron speciosissima, which means very showy. Um, the Clarodendrons, I think it's a fairly big genus, but mostly tropical. This is, uh, and this species generally is not winter hardy, but this is a selection that's supposed to be winter hardy. Mm. And Tony, Plant Delights Nursery is selling one that's supposed to be winter hardy. I think it's Arkansas hardy, I think is the name. But these haven't been through the winter here yet. Um, there are a few clarodendrons that are reliably winter hardy, like um, the Glory Bower. Of course, a lot of trees are called Glory Bower which is Clarodendron trichotoma, but um, it has its merits, but Clarodendron trichotoma also tends to spread a lot, so if you have a small garden, you might think twice about planting it. But they bloom for an extended period of time. I didn't realize the, the leaf has sort of changed now that it's growing more vigorously. It was a simple sort of unload leaf, and now it's becoming sort of Slightly load. This is a really fun plant. Uh, a lot of people are surprised when they learn that it's a um, lantana, especially when they see the showy fruit. It's more like a calicarpa. Um, and I used to, you know, the um, plant taxonomists, those people who classify plants, um, have been changing things a lot. And I think at one point, I'm correct in saying that the uh, Calicarpa was in the Verbena family, which would mean the same family as Lantana. And, you know, starts to make you think there's some family resemblance to a Calicarpa. But this is Lantana trifolia. And you see everything is in threes. You have three leaves at a node. You have, you know, three flower clusters at a node um, and so on but I don't know if it's a perennial anywhere it's it's certainly not perennial here but once you plant in the garden it tends to come back in a small way from seed but it's also easy to start from seed um, we do uh, fortify the perennial border occasionally with um, annuals and it, you know Edith Edelman's original design uh, for the perennial border was based on Gertrude Jekyll's perennial border in her book that she, when did she, when was that printed? I think it was printed in 1902? It was more than 100 years ago. Yeah, I think it was 1902. And, um, you know, in her perennial border, she used things like marigolds and stuff like that. It had a backbone of perennials, but she certainly used some annuals. Um, another fun annual is this African foxglove, and both of these are dicots, so I'm not straying too far. And um, this, oh, here's some good flowers. Yeah. See, the flower does look a lot like um, foxglove. It's actually closely related to sesame. Um, This is its seed pod, and uh, um, so I spill the seed. To do this, I need you know a couple extra hands. But any, you now the seed do look a bit like um, sesame. This is the typical color. There's also a white flowered stream. But another plant that is in the giveaway is this uh, selection of Salvia leucantha. It's, you can see the typical color of leucantha, which is sort of a purple violet, but this is Danielle's dream. Um, you know, it's my least favorite selections of Salvia leucantha, and I really like Salvia leucantha. I wish Salvia leucantha was, rely, you know, 100% reliably winter hardy. It'll come back, you know, about half the time, 
we always stick cuttings in the fall to have backups. Um, but you see, instead of the a typical white or purple violet flower, it has um, these sort of grayish calices and a little pink flower. But that, that one's in the giveaway. Um, if you want a, a tip on rooting salvia leucantha in the fall, don't bother trying to root the flowering stems. You might succeed, but it roots very poorly. But this time of year, it starts putting up brand new shoots from the crown of the plant. Those are root in a heartbeat. And they're small right now, but you know, they'll continue growing up until a frost stops. And so there's plenty of time to let them grow a little bit longer. Is that lantana in the giveaway? No, but I, I'll tell you where I, who grows it. Um, Falls Revival Nursery, John Martin and Jeff Bottoms Nursery. Oh, up at uh, Cedar Creek. Yeah, they okay. sell at Cedar Creek Pottery and Craft Gallery up in Creedmoor, just north of Durham. Um, you know, the lantanas of, you know, that was planted about July, maybe. It was planted just, yeah, it was planted in July. Uh, the Perennial Plant Association met in Raleigh the end of July, beginning of August, and that was planted before then. And, you know, this garden is not irrigated. We do water it with hose and sprinklers when it's desperately dry, but you know, things are basically fending for their own out here. So it's a tough plant. And being a lantana, it's likely that deer don't eat it. I've never known deer to eat lantana or calicartha or vitex. <laughs> I'm gonna cry. Oh. Are you guys gonna come down to Holland or let them regrow? Or We're gonna eliminate them. Yeah, um, yeah, and um, you know, over here we were starting to plant where those hollies came down, the rest will come down. Um, I'm full time, you know, all know Tim, he was just here a moment ago, he's full time. Leanne has 20 hours a week, and her first call to duty is working with Dr. Um, Werner and his red bud breeding. Dr. Werner is paying for 20 hours, but we get any time that he doesn't need, which a lot of times is the whole 20 hours. But those are all, well, and we have, this time of year, we have two students who are five to eight hours a week. So um, that's all of the paid employees out in these gardens. Now we do have, many of you are volunteers. We have tons of volunteers helping us in the garden. Um, but still, we don't need a high maintenance thing, you know, a hedge that we only want to be six foot that wants to be 40 feet tall. Um, so what, as we eliminate it, we're gonna have a mixed hedge of various things that will, you know, and this, this end is a little bit tricky because they have to sort of work with the perennial border but also complement the white garden. Um, but further on, um, not so much. Um, how are you going to eliminate them? Are you going to dig them up? I mean, it would be hard to get big machinery back in there. We, um, see, from here to the end and a longer um, length at the other end of the hedge, um, they did get eliminated by big machinery, stump grinders. Mm -hmm. um, Leaf and Limb, a, a local arborist company, they're absolute angels. Once, once a month, they uh, spend half a day or so donating their services to various good causes and they love the Arboretum. Um, when I met with um, Basil Camus, one of the lead principals in the business, before they did any work, you know, I said, well, this is what we'd like you to do. And he'd say, well, we need more, we need more. And they did come out with like 25 employees for three hours that morning. But there's still only so much that 25 employees can do in three mornings. So by when the morning came to the end, they only got this far and at the other end, you'll see where they ended. It's probably about twice the distance. But they were, they were these great big things and they just go in and they sort of essentially sort of digest everything. But now we can't do that because now there's new electrical lines that run along there. So we will cut them down and poison them. 
you know, a friend of me, a friend of mine calls me, he who kills hollies. He, <laughs> um, he likes to, you know. But then uh, how are you going to find something new there? The football's different. Um, slowly and, okay. yeah. We'll, I don't know if we'll get over that side, but just behind the mixed border, you can see things we planted. There's about six plants we planted Saturday morning. Yeah. Um, now, what I what I told the volunteers that were planting them um, Saturday morning, I'm going to put it here. If you encounter a big root, it can be shifted this way or that because we're not planting a formal that garden there. It's it's part of the arboretum, or it's one of this and one of that. And the main purpose is to get them in the ground so they can grow and we can evaluate them. Um, get them out of the nursery and in the brain. Aster Tataricus from the Tatar Mountains in Siberia. Um, superb plant. I don't quite understand why we um, don't have more bloom. Um, well, I'm not seeing foliage, so maybe that's why. Oh, there's a ton of bloom down there. It's just, this aster, despite its height, is usually very good about standing up, but a hurricane was maybe a bit too much for it. <laughs> but it has this, this is its foliage. It has this basil foliage. If you've ever grown or seen horse, horse, horse radish, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, the foliage looks very much like that plant of the fiery condiment um, but then it makes these tall escapes and it's um, you know these October plants are so important for monarchs that are feeding and flying south but other pollinators as well it's pretty good in light part shade um, it's been in gardens forever I know in the older neighborhoods where I live in Durham lots of yards have it it spreads not aggressively but it does spread steadily which is why we have extras to put in the plant giveaway <laughs> uh, um, sometimes you know part of maintenance is controlling you know reducing the size of masses of things which was have been a big focus of ours in the perennial border you know you don't need 20 feet of one monarda or something like that so when we dig out the excess, often we pot them up and put them on the plant cart or give them away. But I highly recommend Aster Tataraka. Um, there are two almost identical species. Um, down between the visitor center and McSwain is what is, will be in the um, plant giveaway. The two species are, well, they're both Muhlenbergias, named for a German with the family name of Muhlenberg. Muhlenbergia capillaris, referring like capillaries, thread-like, and um, the other one is philippes. And the way I finally remembered which one was which, because I realized they bloom in alphabetical order. Oh. <laughs> capillaris is the one that's sort of at its peak now. It's a smaller, lower plant. This is philippes, which is a bigger and later blooming plant. I saw this um, right at the edge of the bay in uh, the Gulf Coast of Florida, one January is still blooming. Um, they're, they're really uh, beautiful plants, sort of amazingly colorful for ornamental grass. There are a number of chrysanthemums in the giveaway, all of them, um, you know, favorites of ours. One is Gethsemane Moonlight, which is a pale yellow, good-sized daisy mum. And the other one is a single red one, which we actually didn't have it planted in the ground until this past Saturday, but it's a one I've had at home forever. To not a bright, bright red, but sort of definitely a red, sort of a slightly muted red. But is it straw? I have the Gethsemane, and it's just like I mean, I I, I trimmed it back like I was supposed to in July. It's still massive. Well, some of the mums you need to cut back more than once. Yeah, so, uh, some of these um, uh, very reliably winter hardy. Daisy mums are very vigorous and a lot of them are sprawly and that's why you do need to cut them back several times. Um, usually, you know, about like July and maybe a month later and just to keep them shorter. Because if you allow them to grow up, they're going to flop further forward. Um, 
this one I don't think we cut back um, and this is a single pink one I think this might be country girl which is a real pretty pretty pink one we have plants of one of the best of the salvia micropholis salvia micropholis and gregii are very similar species and a lot of the uh, salvias that are in the nursery trade are probably hybrids between the two this is one it's taking a slight vacation but will soon be back in full bloom up until a hard frost this is san carlos festival there's a few flowers you see it's a bright sort of fuchsia but it's good strong very cold hardy um, vigorous grower a moment ago we were looking at the salvia leucantha danielle's dream which is sort of the you know a very different form now salvia leucantha leucantha actually means white flower you know if you're from the medical field leukocytes or white blood cells well leucantha means antha is flower so leucantha means white flowers and you're looking at this and saying well what's <laughs> white about this well in the I guess the typical form, or at least the salvia leucantha that got the name, both of them have these fuzzy um, purple calyces. Cal the calyx is when the sepals, the, the structure that's below the petals, forms into a cup. That's the calyx, or the calyx is just the name for the whole whorl of sepals. And in the, the salvia leucantha, the actual flower, and I'm going to pull it out there. That's the actual flower is white. Um, so this is an all purple form and sometimes it shows up in the nursery trade as all purple. I think more often nowadays it's sold as midnight. But again, not a hundred percent reliably winter hardy, but it sure is a glorious thing in the fall. So if you plant it in the spring, um, it it's just, you know, makes October worthwhile. Of course, October is worthwhile anyway. Um, and this is one plant. You see, it's a great big vigorous thing. There is a shorter selection, which probably, you know, I often object to uh, the stumpification of perennials. Um, but this guy can get taller than this, and especially in a windstorm or a thunderstorm, can crack open and lay on the ground. The shorter one is one called Santa Barbara. Of course, what I most want is one that's reliably winter hardy. I don't think this is on the list because there's not a large number of pots, but this is something that'll be in the middle of the giveaway field, which, which is where we put things that aren't in large enough numbers to go by a stake. This is one of the ginger lilies. This is um, Hedicium. Uh, the cultivar is Daniel Weeks um, and this is one of our favorites because it starts blooming early and repeats up until frost. Um, it, it's not in one of its peak flushes right now. Um, you can see, you know, like here's a inflorescence that's already finished blooming. And then you have another one that's starting. So as it puts up new canes, it continues to bloom. We have a little bit of a hole here because the um, electrical line that went through to power these lights, which are now a permanent part of the garden, the main line had to go through here. This is the same species of Malva viscus, the Scotchman's purse, but a pink one. This is not the one known as Pam's pink. Oh, and we were talking about those hybrid salvias, the blue salvias. This is um, indigo spires, and it can get taller um, than this. It's sort of being supported by its neighbors, and it has looked a little bit shabbier than usual since the hurricane. The uh, heliotropium, does that just not bloom this time of year much? Is it kind of done, or was that, you think, the moisture? Um, Very little of it's blooming. Right? Yeah, no, and there was tons in the Lawrence border, and we cut it all down um, last week. Um, it is a little bit of bloom. Um, Marilyn is asking about this plant. 
it's a, a heliotrope. It's, um, it doesn't have any fragrance, which is a shame because the probably better known heliotrope that is sometimes grown as an annual, at least the old fashioned forms, have an absolutely delicious uh, fragrance. But this looks a lot like a verbena, grows flat on the ground. It, dies away in the winter but it's winter hardy so it returns each spring. We tend to get huge number of seedlings but we don't grumble about that because it'll bloom all summer long through the hottest dry summer and pollinators love it. It's, it's showy. It's, you know I can't sell it to you today because it looks like this but it's a superb garden plant um, and I think it's normally would um, be blooming more still than it is this year. I think those two weeks of a cooler gray very wet weather sort of slowed it down okay. um, do you cut it back then in the winter or it's, do you leave it oh it's absolutely hideous it has no winter interest right so do you cut it back yeah cut it to the to ground okay. no 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 um well i uh, you're probably referring to this uh, um i'm gonna i'm sorry i'm gonna use the term old wives tale i know i shouldn't use that term um that you have to leave your lantana's stems standing so increase their winter hardiness. I don't know anyone who's actually tested that. Somebody gets this idea and then it becomes carved in stone fact that is inviolate. Um, um, but I don't know anybody who's tested it. I'm not convinced that leaving lantana stems through the winter will increase their survival through the winter. I've cut cut two of the same variety. I cut one back and one not. Now they weren't in the same places, but similar. And the one that I cut back took a lot longer to start growing. I mean, I, that's all I can say is it took longer to start growing and then to bloom. Yeah, and that could be, you, you, you tested it, but as you say, they weren't in the same location. So, you know, maybe the one that took longer doesn't, it's not in this warm a sunny spot or something. But, you know, that's something we could test here, but um, I don't understand why it would. So you, oh, cut, it's okay to cut it back when it's ugly? This plant specifically? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And lantana also? I do. Okay. Yeah. And, what about, and they always, I've always read on chrysanthemums not to cut those back because the hollow stem is going to get water in and freeze and rot the crown. My mother grew chrysanthemums in northern New Jersey near New York City. Um, the, the beautiful single uh, daisy. daisy one, yeah. Hillside Pink, mm -hmm. is from a nursery in uh, Connecticut. Um, you know, and I, I gave that one to uh, a friend in Malvern, Pennsylvania. You know, they're winter hardy. We're zone seven. They survive at least zone six. So don't worry about cutting them back. With I don't worry about them. Well, for one thing. This stem is not going to come back. Um, I can do this, you can't. <laughs> <laughs> this stem, it, the, there's new growth is not going to come from this new stem next year. These are rhizomes, which are underground stems. The new growth is going to come from these. Okay. Yeah. And, um, if you look at stems on a cold winter's morning, you will see that there is moisture at the bottom of the stem and the stem sort of explodes with all these ice crystals. So it's happening whether or not the stem is cut or not. Okay. You know, I could be wrong that maybe there is value in not um, cutting them back, but I tend to cut back. I love the herbaceous plants that are attractive in the winter months, but the ones that aren't, I'm happy to cut down. Okay. Of course, there's you know, for wildlife, there's, you know, good reason to leave it all standing until the bitter end, but it's a balancing act. Oh, no, don't do it. You gotta take her. <laughs> well, that, and that, that's the one, one of the ones that's in the giveaway, but you yeah, might I'm be as... take it for uh, demonstration purposes. Sure, sure. Thank you. Which one is that? Gethsemane Moonlight. Okay. It was looking it's glorious gorgeous. before the rain. But this is the low end, and you know, when you have seven inches of rain, a bit more than seven inches of rain, the water just can't drain away quickly enough. But it'll be fine. The color of the flowers are about the color of this. Uh, 
have a mosque which is just a lovely soft wall. If anybody wants some and doesn't get it in the giveaway, I can share some of mine because my patch is here on this now. Yeah, these things are vigorous and, you know, there are those Not people yet. who will grow it and then they'll fuss at us for giving them something that's red. <laughs> um, we'll be, be covered in flowers. I haven't looked at it since I took cuttings in early spring. I don't know what's going on with it. it certainly looks like something's been eating it, caterpillar or something. But, you know, the red calyx persists while the flowers open and the flowers a stronger yellow than the little one we saw in the pot up there, the But, you know, great plant. I think this spot has maybe gotten a little bit too shady for it. It prefers bright light shade or part, part day sun over um, hot, hot sun, but this spot might have gotten too shady for it. So I think the bigger problem right now is somebody's been nibbling on it. Seems to have been a really good year for um, caterpillars. You're showing me the time? Okay, we, we will stop. Um, that didn't cover many of the plants in the giveaway, but um, a few of them. Well, thank you very much for thank coming you, out. Thank sure. you, dog. Yeah.